Two-minute anaesthesia, cerebral blood flow. Cerebral blood flow. First of all, it's important to understand the difference between flow and pressure. So pressure is the force applied to an object per unit surface area, whilst flow is the quantity of fluid, gas, liquid or vapour, that passes a point per unit time. We classically use the hagen Pascal equation, which is in the bottom right corner, to describe the key properties affecting laminar flow. So if you increase the pressure of the fluid or the radius of the tube, that increases flow. However, if you increase the viscosity of the liquid going through, that reduces flow. These properties can be used to describe the factors which affect cerebral blood flow. So cerebral blood flow, on average, is 50 mils per 100 grams of tissue per minute. And this is based off of grey and white matter. So grey matter has a higher cerebral blood flow of 100 mils per 100 grams of tissue per minute, whilst white matter is 20 mils per 100 grams of tissue per minute. This represents 15% of cardiac output. Cerebral blood volume is 5 mils per 100 grams of tissue per minute. Here are three key equations. Cerebral perfusion pressure is often used as a surrogate marker for cerebral blood flow. However, it fails to take into account cerebral vascular resistance. So cerebral perfusion pressure is equal to MAP minus ICP. And in a normal healthy adult, CPP is variable, but usually ranges between 70 to 90 millimetres of mercury. Cerebral blood flow is equal to cerebral perfusion pressure over cerebral vascular resistance. And this is constant over a set range of pressures due to changes in vessel calibre. A range of different factors can affect cerebral blood flow. And these will be discussed on this slide and subsequent. These can be split up into arterial CMR water and venous supply. Within the arterial supply, this is affected by the vessel wall diameter and the composition of the blood. First of all, vessel wall diameter, autoregulation. This is sorted due to the myogenic mechanisms. So as MAP increases, the transmural pressure tension increases, and this results in depolarization of vascular smooth muscle and constriction of pre-capillary resistance vessels. Flow metabolic coupling. So as cerebral blood flow is variable across the brain, and this is due to differences in neuronal activity. So as the neuronal activity increases, there's increased chemical composition, of CO2, adenosine and phospholipids, which results in an increase in cerebral blood flow to ensure this flow metabolic coupling. Autonomic nervous system. The cerebral vascular receives its postganglionic sympathetic nervous supply from the superior cervical ganglion, and therefore sympathetic stimulation results in vasoconstriction and chronic stimulation can result in the shift of the autoregulation curve to the right, i.e. chronic hypertension. Blood. So gases, CO2 and O2 have effects on cerebral blood flow. Hematocrit, increase in hematocrit can result in a reduction in cerebral blood flow. CMR O2 and venous supply. So the patient's position, thoracic pressure and impedance to flow out of the vein via the venous supply can affect cerebral blood flow. Autoregulation, so cerebral blood flow remains constant over a range of different pressures from 50 to 150 millimetres of mercury. And this is due to change in the vessel wall diameter. So as the pressure decreases, the diameter, the calibre of the vessel increases. Above 150 millimetres of mercury, there's a risk of hypoperfusion. And below 50, there's a risk of ischemia to the tissue in the brain. For chronic hypertension, the curve is shifted to the right. These two important graphs compare the partial pressures of either carbon dioxide or oxygen with cerebral blood flow on the y-axis and the partial pressures on the x-axis. First of all, for CO2, there's a linear relationship between 3 to 11 kilopascals of carbon dioxide and cerebral blood flow, i.e. you double the CO2, you double the flow due to increased vascular diameter. Interestingly, a chronically raised PaCO2 results in a shift of this curve to the right. Next, for oxygen, for PaO2's less than 8 kilopascals, there's a steep inflection point whereby below 8 kilopascals, the cerebral blood flow increases significantly. However, above 8 kilopascals, there's a constant cerebral blood flow for a given PaO2. CMRO2, i.e. the rate of oxygen consumption by the brain. This is 3.5 mils per 100 grams of tissue per minute, or 50 mils per minute. The cerebral blood flow and CMR are coupled, which means that as the oxygen consumption requirements increase, 
so the blood flow also increases. There's also a range of factors which increase and decrease CMRO2, so increased cerebral activity, seizures, pyrexia increase CMRO2 and therefore increase with cerebral blood flow, whilst hypothermia reduces CMRO2 and therefore reduces cerebral blood flow.